Hi all. And first of all, thank you to DevOps Lisbon for this opportunity to share my viewpoint on why do we need more women on DevOps teams? Why do we need more women in tech teams, by the way? Well, I'm Christina, and I believe the very best thing my parents ever did for me was getting me a ZS Spectrum. Anybody heard of them? Have you, anybody had one of those? <laughs> yes. Well, along with moral values and all of that, <laughs> they bought me a Spectrum, and I really fell in love with that tiny little basic manual. And soon enough, where everybody was playing their games, I was building my own. <laughs> So it was no surprise that even before I, I finished my management degree, I was already working on a management consulting firm and doing what? Programming. That's what I love to do. That's what I've been doing all of my life. I have, all of my degrees are on management, and all of, everything I do is about programming and building things that somebody else can use. <laughs> um, when, when I entered that uh, consulting firm, I had as a boss, a wonderful woman at all aspects, and she's still today one of my strongest female role models, and maybe because of that, I'm still here today. Um, and with her, I, we started working at a newly created, male-only, Banco Comercial Português. Do you remember that time when Jardim Gonçalves, its president, did not hire women? Well, my team of consultants working there, implementing a methodology for uh, requirements analysis and implementation was all female. <laughs> so you can imagine how hard it was to go to the bathroom or grab a cup of coffee or get, up, get, get in in the morning or go out for lunch and every set of eyes was stuck in our neck all day long. Everything we did was subject to scrutiny. Everything we said, every meeting we had. But well, the job was done and well done, and uh, the methodology was in use for, for a very long time. And sometime after we, we got out of there and we finished the, the project, we heard that Jardim Gonçalves was uh, hiring women for the first time, which led to, to, very, to a great satisfaction of our own. And then, some years later, almost on the turning of the century, uh, my team and I, working for a, a software company, my team and I were the first one to implement an e-commerce solution for the male-dominated public administration. And then, about well, this millennium already, I joined Portugal Telecom, now Altice Portugal, and I realized that <laughs> Uh, the scarcity of women in uh, uh, management roles was overwhelming. It was afflictive. So there I was, newly arrived to, to that big, big company, and um, I was leading a group of a bunch of people, and uh, we were trying to, to um, implement some very highly... Uh, uh, projects uh, with high visibility projects, such as the first uh, network, internal network for all the companies of the group, PT, the first uh, e-commerce e-business initiative, the first um, corporate email solution and all that. And I was entering a meeting room with more than 20 people only to find out that if I was not the only woman in the room, I was one of the two two three very few women there. And you can imagine rapidly that throughout all this time, it was very common for me to hear things like, oh, honey, I was entering a, a meeting room and I, somebody told me, oh, honey, go get us a cup of coffee, will you? Or, oh, you're here to take notes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, no, I'm here to lead the meeting. <clears throat> And that's my, that's my uh, reality for a long, long time. Not now anymore, thank goodness, but it was my reality for a long, long time. So um, watching all that is happening now, I think it's time for standing up and say, we women can also play cards in DevOps. And that's why we're here today. Well done. 
I believe women can do DevOps, and yes, women can multitask. And yes, this is a little bit teaser for you, just a little bit. But I should know that, being married for 20 years, and being a mother or two, and uh, having specialized in um, uh, uh, cross-functional collaboration for more than 20 years, so I should know about that. But really, let's look at DevOps definition at its core. I used Donovan Brown's definition so we can uh, see it here today. And we see that DevOps is all about working together for a common success criteria. Working together, collaboration. Well then, can't collaboration do, do without diversity? I believe it can't. You have to have real diversity so you can have real collaboration. Well, when you work, <laughs> when you work long enough in these areas, of course, you remember scenarios like this. It works on my machine. It's not my problem anymore. It's working fine. Now it's your problem. Ops, deal with it, right? So we quickly understood that there is a gap between dev and ops. And then we could quickly understood that there is a gap throughout the organization. So how are we going to bridge that gap? How are we going to reduce inefficiencies? We automate. Automation is key. So we began automation, everything that, automating everything that could be repeatable, that could be predictable. And so a new set of tools, a new set of jargon emerged, and we are very, very happy. Uh, automating and yes, improving our processes along the way and yes, reducing a lot of inefficiencies. So we started talking about continuous delivery, about test automation, about uh, <laughs> yes, release management, <laughs> about de deployment automation, about uh, configuration automation and how are you going to do all these things. But there's one thing, neither of these creates effective teams. So what does? Google spent eight years studying what makes teams effective. And what they found out is that there is one characteristic that makes teams effective, which is trust. Psychological f safety. For me to know that I can speak my mind, I can experiment, I can fail, and my co-workers, co my teammates, will still have my back. That's trust. Well then, but how do you build trust? Well, this article that I put here in the slide, I enlist some things that we can do to help us build trust. And I chose the first three of them, which are basically listen. But do not listen only with your eyes or with your ears. Listen with your eyes, observe, ask questions out of curiosity, not just to hear someone that has a different opinion from yours so you can argue. Ask them for real curiosity. Why do you say that? What do you think we could improve? What do you think the results will be, etc.? There are questions that not only give you a broader insight of what your, co -team, uh, your, your teammates are, are thinking, but also passes on the message that what's important to them, it's important to you. So ask those questions, please. And as you ask them, you are showing this cognitive empathy because you understand how their mind is working and you understand what lies behind those arguments that they are presenting. But also you can go further and you can show some emotional empathy. And how do you do that? For example, a team, uh, a team a colleague of yours is feeling overwhelmed with their to-do list, their endless to-do list. And you can say, well, I don't feel overwhelmed with that. I prioritize my actions and I know what I have to do and everything else waits for the next day. Good. But you can remember the last time you felt stressed, under pressure, overwhelmed with something else. No problem. But you can relate to what your, your coworker is feeling. And when you relate to his or her emotions, then you are showing some emotional empathy. 
And yes, be authentic, be genuine, be you. Nobody wants to relate with a mask. Nobody wants to establish a relationship with someone they don't even know what they're thinking or what they're feeling. Be you. I believe in bringing your whole self to work. I believe in that. I believe in being open, in being transparent. I believe that establish is the first thing that establishes trust because people know you for who you are. And you're a whole self, so bring it to work. Be vulnerable if you have to be. Be impatient if you, if you are. Be imperfect. That's you. So now we build trust. So now we can close the cycle because trust makes you have commit commitment, makes you uh, feel something about your company makes you feel something about your fellow co-workers, make you feel something about your team. That's commitment. That's openness. And then we close the cycle here, and we establish a trust environment that allows us to look at production data and feed the process since the beginning so we can really have improvements. But make no mistake, while you cannot have a blameless post-mortem without throwing blames at each other, you do not have a real trust environment. The first thing, the first key, the indicator of trust is having a blameless post-mortem without throwing blames. A real blameless post-mortem. Your team must understand that unless everybody wins, nobody wins. And that's trust. OK, so we've talked about empathy. This psychopathology professor in, in Cambridge believes that women <laughs> brains are hardwired for empathy. And that does not diminish their capability of coding, OK? <laughs> yes, they can empathize and they can code, <laughs> OK? While the male brain, uh, male brain is predominantly hardwired for building and automating and understanding how things work. So what's the secret weapon? Let's combine this information. Let's combine these capabilities. I'm not saying that all women can emphasize and all men can, can build better. That's not what I said. What I said is a female brain typically is hardwired for empathy, whereas uh, a male brain is typically hardwired for building. But if, oh, sorry. But if we combine the two of them, we can, for instance, keep things like, I'm sure it doesn't happen with you, only with me, but sometimes we get across some fixtures in our product that are there not because somebody asked them or because the client or the customer really needs them, but because somebody thought the product got sexier with that. Nobody asked him. And sometimes, some feature that is really, really important is not exactly implemented as it should because nobody understood really what, how it was going to be used. So empathy, empathy is really, really important. And where do we stand at women? We're, to, we're talking about women in DevOps teams. So where do we stand today? We have at Puppet State of Reports, State of DevOps Report 2017, we had a stunning 6% respondents that were women. Mm, compared to 5% in 2016, yes, we are growing. Yes, and a third of respondents said they worked with in, in teams with no women at all. Doesn't that bother you? <coughs> Come on, where are all those Simon, all those science graduates, female science graduates? Doesn't this bother you? It does bother me. Oh wait, science graduates, right. They're fewer and fewer by the air. Do you know this? This is Portuguese data. We have less than 20% women in our, our uh, universities studying computer science. Doesn't that bother you? It does bother me. Why do you think this is happening? 
Why do you think all girls go to life sciences and all boys go to computer science? Does that make any sense? It doesn't make to me. But that's what's happening in Portugal. Not abroad, it's happening in Portugal. And these numbers have been fallen for the last 23 years. 23 years. Doesn't that bother you? Do you think this happened because the male geek prototype or uh, stereotype of the 80s got stuck on our minds, where computers were sold as machine toys for boys? Do you think this is happening because we don't have enough female role models? Do you think this is happening because it's a cultural given that programming jobs are a 24-7 job, and even if you're not working, you have to be eating, drinking, sleeping, breathing, programming? I don't know why it's happening. I really don't know, but it bothers me a lot. And we've got to do something about this. Not only because it's politically correct or it's the right thing to do. We've got to change this because it's our money on the line here. And this study by McKinsey at the beginning of this year showed us that uh, all the companies that are on the top quartile of uh, gender diversity are able to have 21% higher profitability than the others. 33% uh, when we're talking about uh, all ethnic diversity, especially for companies operating worldwide. So it's money we're talking about, if not all the rest. Of course, below, <laughs> uh, the, the, the bottom quartile gives us 29% below prof profitability, the medium profitability. And other things. We all know, or we all attribute this kind of characteristics to women. Can't you do with these characteristics in your projects? They're very useful to me. Can't you do with them? More, technology is better when, it's, when it is designed for everybody, then it should be designed by everybody. And by the way, make sure it works. We, we have some examples in the notes of failed voice recognition, face recognition solutions. And because unless they are tested and applied to male, white male individuals, they cannot work. They struggle with understanding women's voices. They struggle with understanding uh, other, other faces that are not, not white. Doesn't that bother you? And besides, you need women because the demand for tech workers and for STEM graduates, and STEM stands for science, technology, and engineering, and maths, it's greater than the universities can deliver on male. Then you really, if you want to, to, to have all your uh, opportunities um, closed, you really have to hire some women. So where do you begin? Where do we start? What, sh what should we do? These are three ideas, and there are ideas only. And I'm sure it's not the only thing we can do. But there are some ideas here. First of all, emotions. Emotions are important enough to have some development on them. We have services like cognitive service and other um, implementations and solutions that already are in place to understand and identify emotions. So they are important. We want to know what people are feeling. We will want to know what is crossing their minds. So if they are important, they should be dealt with. And you cannot say it's all right for a guy like Steve Jobs to, okay, sorry, <laughs> bad example, but it's, it's okay for a guy. To, to shout and curse and throw things at, at, at one another. And that's not right for women. You cannot have that kind of bias. Either it's right or it's wrong for both genders, for first of all. And then, ladies, be the leader you want to see. Em bom português. Cheguem-se à frente. Façam alguma coisa. Okay? Offer to speak. 
to and offer some female role models for those girls that are starting now, for example. And please don't try to behave like men. Please, we are really, really different. Please don't try. Even if your role models have been men for the whole, all your life, please don't try to behave like men. It doesn't suit you. <laughs> okay, and lastly, you might want to, to follow the work of some examples that I put here. The first one is, is the CEO for Girls Who Code. The second is um, engineer, a DevOps engineer at, at IBM. The third is the CEO for, of DORA. You know what DORA is, uh, DevOps uh, Research and Assessment. And they co-worked on the State of DevOps report we, uh, we saw earlier. And Jessica is a DevOps engineer at Microsoft. You may want to follow their work. So, this is important enough? Somebody thought it was. So important that since 2015, we have an international day of women and girls in science. And here is what the UN <laughs> Secretary General said this year about the subject. And I'm not going to read it for you. You have it on your slides, on your notes later on. But it's the third year we're commemorating this, this day, so it should be really important, right? Come on, we got to do something. We got to build a better future for our sons and daughters. We've got to, to bring some equity and some equal opportunities for those, both of them. Isn't that what we want for the future? Because the future is not a place that we're going to go. The future is something that we're going to create. Don't we want to create something better? That's it. Thank you. Some of the research that you cited with regards to men and women being hardwired differently is actually quite outdated. A lot of okay. the gender stuff shows that actually it's a social construct. Girls are told to be more empathetic, and boys are told that they are not allowed to show emotion. So unfortunately, it seems that while I agree with where the future you want to go, you're continuing to perpetuate some of the stereotypes by saying, we should have women on our team because they're nice and they empathize. No, we should have women on our team because they bring a different point of view, just like we should have people who are Asian, we should have Africans on our team. We shouldn't just have white men doing things. I happen to have the privilege to work at Tectris, which LT funds. I yes. find it very interesting. On the first floor, you walk in and you go to the bathroom. There are no signs on the bathrooms. There is a door painted pink, and there is a door painted blue. I think that might go a long way to showing that our gender and ideas of gender in technology are really social constructs, and not this idea of women being hardwired to be empathetic and men being hardwired to be uh, problem solvers. We have just as much diversity within genders as we have across genders. And on that point, do you think there's more that Altice could be doing for its, in its services that it provides to whether it be outreach or things in schools that they could be doing to help just, um, I don't know, deconstruct these uh, gender stereotypes and encourage men and women to approach problem solving and approach empathy on equal footing? Thank you for a question, very, very pertinent. And yes, I agree with you. What I try to say here is that, yes, women, as they empathize, they understand better how to construct something. That was what I, what I was trying to do. Whereas when you have ethnic <laughs> diversity, also all those point of views bring some richness that otherwise you wouldn't have. It's the same thing. It's the same principle. And yes, maybe it is outdated, and maybe all the research that uh, the guy at Google used for, for, for writing his memo was also up, uh, outdated. And yes, there's always something more that Artis Portugal can do about it. And the first step has been taken in, in Tectris House, um, and, and all the things that we are uh, talking about when we go to schools, for instance, in the, the day of secure internet, for instance, it's, uh, it doesn't have any gender bias. We're talking about 
uh, all the, the risks, for instance, that teenagers have in the internet are like boys and girls. And everything we do with the younger gen generations does not present any gen gender bias. Yes, there can be something else we can do. There can be a lot of work we can do, and we're working on it. And if you have more ideas, please bring, the, bring the don, them on. And, but yes, we can do better, but our mindset is there. Our mindset is let's treat them alike. Let's do, for instance, we don't have uh, quotas in our uh, company. Everybody that gets a management role gets there for merit, for example. Something like that. We, we don't have quotas for uh, women. We don't have for, for ethnic diversity. And everybody has a meritocracy um, standard that is going on. And we know what, what we should achieve if we want to be promoted and we, if we want to have, for instance, a managerial role. So you see not having quotas as a, a, a gender positive and diversity positive thing. I mean, when you consider the fact that look at Denmark. I mean, no one's thinking that the women who are sitting on boards in Denmark are getting there just because of quotas. Those women are all fully qualified for the exactly. job that they're doing. Exactly. But there is a nationally regulated quota now that says, and we have it now here in Portugal, thank goodness, on our boards, that says we cannot have one board that's comprised of only one gender. <clears throat> And that's not to say that there are women would only be, get on boards because of their gender, but the fact that we're saying to boards, you need to look around at a larger pool of people. Because we know when you hire someone, study after study has shown that you are most likely to hire someone who looks like you, who comes from where you come that. from, who studied what you studied, or studied where you studied. So if we continue to have white men in power, we will only continue to have white men in the ranks behind them unless we start to force companies to say, you need to look outside. So I don't necessarily think if not having a quota, Altice is not on the same level as we have in Nordic countries right now. Though I'm sure it would like to be, it's not there yet. So I don't think not having quotas is something to be proud of. Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> no, because at the state that we have here, uh, in Portugal and other uh, European countries, we really need quotas to have to help women move along and go, and go up uh, some some more levels. Yes, you're right about that. But the other the other aspect of it is that having quotas uh, almost obliges the the uh, companies to look for women for those particular roles, and maybe they are not hiring the most. Um, uh, the the best match for the for the part. Yes, okay, they have a woman there, but if she's not that that well qualified, what will that do to even women fame overall? That may not be good. I don't want to. Um, I think, to be perfectly honest, that's an outdated philosophy. We have far too many well-educated women in this country for that to be a serious concern. That the women who are hired are just hired because they're a gender higher. I think that's the stereotype that I'm and thinking. Then you don't need quotas. If they don't need if they don't need to be hired because of the quotas, then it, you don't need quotas. So do I. Yes, yes, that, that's what I said. At this time, we really need them. Yes, but it's not the, the, the best thing to do. In the, hopefully in the future, culturally, we can adapt. Yes. Yes. Unfortunately, I agree with you. Yes. yes. I think that's what you're trying to say. Yes. I, I see many people, let me just say this, I see many people, especially in tech, that doesn't believe in quotas. I, I see many women who doesn't believe in quotas, but I think that's because they don't understand the why, why they're there. Unfortunately, 
I believe with you. We really need coatings at the time being. Hopefully, well, as we move along, maybe we won't need them anymore. Yes. <laughs> One last question, anyone? I have a question. So, we're all here. We all came to listen to you. So we're all invested. Thank you. We're all invested in that topic. We're all interested. You're probably the person who decided to paint those, col those colors on those doors blue and pink. Don't intend this kind of event. Yes. So what more can we do in our own corporations and organizations? Well, first of all, why don't you bring this discussion inside your company? That's something we've been discussing, for instance, at Altis Porsco. That's something you can start with. And while bringing it, it, it cannot be only at your pay grade. It can, you have to, to bring on directors, you have to bring on managers, and you have to have an open discussion about it. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.